Hello, everyone. Welcome to the special edition of the IAB webinar. Today, we'll be talking about the four ways publishers can use location data to enhance advertising and content products. My name is Eva Wu. I'm a senior manager at the IAB Mobile Center of Excellence, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. A couple of notes on logistics before we get started. Everyone is muted. Feel free to ask questions at any time during the webinar. If you would like to ask a question, please just write to us through the question window on the control panel. And we'll answer some questions as we go along and also queue up some for the Q&A session at the end. And one of the questions we get a lot is whether a recording of the webinar will be available. And we'd like to answer that right away, and the answer is yes. And we'll send you a follow-up email after the webinar with the recording. So today's webinar is a special edition brought to you by the IAB Mobile Center of Excellence. For those of you who are not familiar with, familiar with the IAB Mobile Center, it is the mobile hub within IAB. Uh, under the mobile center, we have a number of committees and working groups that set out to educate the marketplace, improve mobile creative, establish reliable measurement standards, reduce friction in the supply chain, and advocate for the industry. And today's webinar is a project by the Mobile Location Data Working Group. And I want to give you a little context on how it all came about. So the Mobile Location Data Working Group got together last year, and they decided to develop a guide for publishers in regards to the use of location data. Because buyers have been increasingly adopting location-based advertising, and we realized that there's a need for an educational document for publishers, so that publishers can rally around best practices to take full advantage of the demand. So the Location Data Working Group was hard at work for several months for the second half of 2015 and early 2016. And in February this year, the Working Group issued a document called ID Mobile Location Data Guide for Publishers. And it offers monetization tactics for publishers with the use of location data. In today's webinar, we'll break down the key points in the document for you. And here with me are three contributors to the document. They're the experts behind the document, and in just one minute, I'll turn it over to them to walk you through the major insights. Um, and they are Alan Segal, Senior Director of Analytics, Insights, and Optimization from Cox Media Group, Vikas Gupta, Director of Marketing and Operations from Factual, and Kevin Chan, VP of Product Management from Nice Decimal. And uh, we just wanted to take this moment and say that thanks to all of the other industry leaders who also contributed to the document, and it's definitely a team effort. So for today, we'll first talk about the four major benefits for publishers to leverage location. And then we'll talk about how you can get started on data collection and data activation to take advantage of the four benefits. We'll have a Q&A session at the end, but feel free to ask any questions throughout the webinar. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Alan Segal, Senior Director of Cox Media Group. Alan, take it away. Thanks, Eva. Hello, everybody. So we're going to talk a little bit about, or we're going to start with, the, the major benefits for the location data. Um, you know, the price premium, premium for location enhanced inventory, really, you're looking at enhanced ad targeting capabilities, and this essentially drives higher um, both fill rates and CPMs. Um, the increased revenue via data licensing, I mean, what additional incremental revenue can you get for your data that other folks might be able to use? Um, you want to amplify, amplify audience insights, so what can you as a publisher do to leverage um, that information about how your audience is using your content. And meet, uh, meet buyers, increasing demand for offline sales as a, as a KPI. And essentially, it's really the ROI story and what can you do to improve that process for the buyers and um, establish a higher value for your inventory. So going into data collection, we have, so essentially there are two types of data. Well, there are many types of data. Um, but for location data, we're talking about uh, first party and third party. And you know, your first party data location information is the stuff that you own. You yourself have or your, your site has. Um, 
and you can get that in a couple of different ways. Um, the device itself is telling you that um, maybe an I um, geo information. Um, the user may have registered on on your site in your app, or in some way they are a known person to you, and they've given you some information. Um, and then you can also translate um, other first-party information, like the IP address, into sort of a known location. Although that can sometimes be tricky because we know that IP addresses. Um, sometimes go to places that we don't anticipate. And so that information is more reliable than not, but not perfect. And it's it's best when you have your own data because you have, you should have the most confidence in it. But also third-party data. Um, and not to say that, that third-party data is in any way bad. Third-party data can be especially valuable um, for publishers who, one, don't have a whole lot of first-party data, or two, don't have the infrastructure to, to gather it in a meaningful way. And um, the quality of the third-party data can be excellent, but it, that's an important thing uh, when evaluating where you're getting your, your location data from and who you're partnering with. Um, but uh, a publisher can use third-party data in, in a number of ways and, and come from all kinds of places places, exchanges, DSPs, SSPs, um, uh, a dedicated data provider, they all have that information and they can, they can partner with you to make that happen. Um, and then that data is typically appended to your inventory uh, so that it can be um, better leveraged by advertisers to um, either recognize it as valuable to them and they want to bid on it, or just to drive up CPMs in terms of um, you have a very specific location, for example, and, and perhaps uh, it's a very desirable area, and so others will compete for that and drive that price up for you for your benefit. So when it comes to how we collect that information, mobile devices, obviously, there's the, the sort of the split between mobile web and apps. Um, you know, the way, well, the primary distinction between web and apps comes down to the mobile browser. Um, when you have your own app, you can do many more things with it, simply because you built it, you have your data requests in there, uh, there may be an SDK that you're leveraging and the APIs, and there, there are pieces that you can pull out that you're not going to have the same flexibility with a mobile web browser. Those are locked down by um, whether it's a Safari or Chrome or um, any of the other providers that are out there. There are rules and there are limitations. One of the biggest ones is going to be around privacy. Whereas in an app, you can pretty much ask for them, uh, for the user to share that permission uh, to, to get the data. In a mobile web browser, you're pretty much going to have to ask for that permission every time they go to the publisher page. Um, at every session. So, you know, if they come back the next day, you're going to have to uh, push that message in front of them. It's not a purely desirable experience for anyone. Um, and ultimately, you know, you're, you're limited in the data that you're going to be able to get there. Mostly it's going to be IP-based. Um, and that's, that's just not ideal. And ultimately, I would say, if you can make it happen within an app, the specificity of data that you can get, instead of, let's say, an IP address, you can get down to the latitude and longitude, um, even things like altitude. I don't, uh, maybe you're a ski resort and you want to know if they're at the, <laughs> you're advertising to someone at the top of the mountain versus bottom of the mountain. Um, there are different, uh, different use cases for all that information. And depending on your use case, you can put that into your app to pull that out. Much more flexibility there. So the three pillars of quality location data. I think um, it goes without saying that accuracy is where you would like to start. Um, you know, accuracy refers to the mobile user's true real-time location at the time of an ad call relative to the uh, location pass from the publisher to the ad platform. You want it to be accurate. It, it's, you know, 
obviously, if it's not accurate, there's no real benefit to the advertiser, um, and and you're not doing them a good service. And possibly for the ad that will come in to the end user, that will also not be uh, not a good experience for them. Next, you have precision. Obviously, you want to get as precise as possible. Depend well. That's not obvious. It depends on your application. Um, you may want to get down to a very precise location because you are maybe at a store. However, if you're trying to advertise, let's say, for a quick serve restaurant, a two, three meter, uh, not meter, a kilometer uh, radius may be just fine. So precision really has to do with the latitude and longitude and just how many points of precision you have. Two decimal points will get you within one kilometer. Four decimal points could get you within 10 meters. So lots of flexibility there. Um, and it's just a matter of how good your source of data is. And then finally, you want recency. Um, fresh data is obviously better. If you have old data um, on a mobile device, it just it's probably not going to matter unless that device is sitting in someone's home. Um, that's or their office. Those are pretty much the only uh, fixed places in a person's life. Everything else, they're on the move, and um, the information is contextually or needs to be contextually correct. So, accuracy, precision, and recency. And so, around data activation, you know, there are two ways to build the capabilities of having location information. Um, the first is to build your own, and that's a that's a great approach for some publishers, um, but it requires resources. It requires um, development capability, and so um, you know there are two major types of of doing that sort of uh, collection. It could be where well, you're either going to do geofencing or um, zip DNA targeting. I think with geofencing, you can get into some detail around uh, point radius, which is really you pick a location on a map and you, you're saying, I would like the data around that, um, or within a certain range, whether that's a kilometer or 10 kilometers or, or, or whatever that might be. Um, you can draw a boundary. So think of um, literally taking a map and drawing some sort of shape around a an area. Um, it can be a complex shape, it can be a square, um, but you're basically drawing a boundary and um, it's typically referred to as a complex polygon and then you want to take, uh, you're, you're matching up the latitude and longitude of the user against that space. And the other sort of take on that is zip DMA targeting. Um, and that's really using much larger zones um, and known zones, whether it's it's a DNA or a zip code, and trying to get a much uh, broader swath of space and matching up. Um, in that case, you might be able to match up an IP address that is going to sit within a DMA or within a particular zip code, depending on, on the level of information you have around the IP address. Um, but again, I said this is kind of hard work, which is why it may be better to partner with an external vendor. Um, as a publisher, I can tell you that um, it's not our core business to do this kind of work. Um, so we outsource this whenever we can, because it's other companies' dedicated reason to be and we know that they can scale that, they can work on it, their accuracy, precision are going to be way better than anything we're going to really end up doing. And they can maintain the infrastructure needed to do that. Um, they've already figured out all the things that we don't even know we don't know yet. And so it's for us, it's a very beneficial uh, um, way of approaching it. But there are publishers that absolutely build their own, um, and it's, it's a perfectly viable option. Um, as long as you have the resources to maintain um, and work in that space. And so, sort of to review, I mean, we, all of these are um, um, 
major benefits, and I think I'm going to pass off to Vikas to um, go down to the next to the next item. Thank you, Alan. Um, so we're going to dig a little bit more into the price premiums for location enhanced inventory. Um, and so a major question is, all right, this all sounds great. Um, I like the idea of making more money. How do I actually make more money? So you know, picking up where Alan left off on the build versus partner discussion, um, assuming you figure that out and now you have some solutions, uh, we generally see this, uh, the way companies activate this data for ad targeting in three different ways. Um, obviously, these three different ways, direct sales, private marketplaces, and the open exchange, they're not mutually exclusive. And in today's world, the distinctions between sort of these three channels uh, are blurring, but uh, it's still a helpful framework um, from a, a, a guidance perspective to think through these. So from a direct sales perspective, if you have your own sales team, if you're out selling your own um, ad units directly to agencies and advertisers, um, you can use these location targeting capabilities to, uh, to create new products to sell to your advertisers, new targeting. Um, you, know, you can sell new audience segments based on location. You can sell the real-time location, as Alan was talking about, of your users. Um, and depending on your inventory and your ad units and how you generally sell, um, you, know, you may see a benefit of anywhere um, up to 30% of, of the CPMs is, is sort of what we heard when we did our research. Um, outside of the direct sales model, there's the private marketplace option. So there we've seen publishers take, um, take various cuts of their inventory and create a private marketplace. From a location perspective, um, you can create a private marketplace around the user's real-time location. So again, you can use some of the tactics that Alan was talking about around regional targeting or zip code or DMA targeting, create a PMP around those. Um, if you're using location-based audiences, you can create private marketplaces around specific audience segments. Um, if you're doing more uh, proximity-based targeting around specific businesses, um, you can create private marketplaces around those as well. And of course, all of these things are starting to blend. Um, so you can do sort of the confluence of the two and layer that onto your existing um, PMP strategy if you're if you're sort of slicing off certain sets of premium inventory. Obviously, with all of these, there's there's sort of the balance of the more the more things you layer together, the 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 more you sort of limit the reach and the amount of inventory. And so there's that sort of balancing line to take. But we've certainly seen uh, publishers set up private marketplaces around all of these things and, and have uh, uh, high level of success. And then sort of at the most basic layer. Um, if, you, uh, if you're trying to monetize Remnant or if you um, don't have the ability or haven't yet been able to incorporate some of these, um, these location targeting capabilities into your, into your ad products, um, you can still gain value from location data on your ad inventory by passing in the lat long of the user into the open exchange. And so open RTB will let you pass in the lat long. It'll also let you um, pass in some, some other metadata that the device pulls around locations, such as the freshness and the speed. Um, and if you're passing that information in, and uh, more importantly, if you are passing in accurate, fresh, and precise information in, um, you should see a, a premium on what you're getting on the open exchange as well, um, because there's a lot of uh, DSPs out there who are hungry for that type of inventory that they'll then use to, to sort of layer on the targeting on their side. All right, so um, in terms of, of how these ad products generally break down, um, you might have heard me mention these in passing on the last slide, and the reason I go into detail them there because we have them here. And so again, these are sort of bright line distinctions in the world where those distinctions are starting to blur. Um, however, generally speaking, you have your proximity-based targeting, which is a real-time targeting tactic, so based on where the user is at the time of the ad. 
and um, it can be uh, some of the regional type elements that Alan talked about, or it can be sort of specific to um, specific businesses, points of interest, or categories. And so, um, you know, you may say, hey, I want to uh, create an ad campaign against people who are currently at auto dealerships, um, people who are near a specific type of retailer, who are near fast food, people who are currently at um, a specific retailer. Um, it's sort of uh, lots of flexibility here in terms of specifying um, the distance to a specific type of point and um, the points themselves. Um, but sort of the key point here is that it's, it's a real-time targeting tactic, and as I mentioned, on the last slide, this can this can be activated both sort of in the direct model and in the PMP model. And then we have the geo-based audiences or the location-based audiences, and this is um, doing an analysis of, a, of the user's location history over time. And so this requires having um, some minimal level of, of data about a given user over time. And so several data points um, over history about a user, um, the more data the better and then you sort of stitch those data points together um, to build a profile of that user. And so you can see things like, oh, this person frequents a certain type of retailer, um, likes to eat at certain types of restaurants, may travel, may not travel, um, lives in a certain zip code, works in a certain zip code. Um, you can sort of derive a tremendous amount of insight, turn those insights and those profiles into segments, and then sell those segments again, activated through either your direct channel or your private marketplaces. Now I'm going to hand it over to Kevin to talk about data licensing. OK. Thanks, Vikas. Uh, and thanks, Alan. So thanks, everybody, for joining. In this section, what we want to do is talk about data licensing. Why data licensing? It's because it's yet another uh, revenue stream for the location data that you may have collected, right? So you guys have heard Alan talk about all the work that you need to do and all the benefits of getting you know, that location data that's really precise that uses you know, location services over an IP address, for example. He talked about having that recency um, and, and having the value of all those insights that you can have for that location data. And so that's really valuable. Now that you've collected that, Vika's talked about how you can monetize that, right? So that location data can be used to get a premium for the inventory that you guys are used to selling. And you know, there's lots of different ways. The PMP strategies that Vika's talked about, proximity versus uh, audience, that's all great. You guys have done your work. You've monetized it. You're used to talking to those media planners. You're used to you know, upselling the value of your inventory. What data licensing provides is yet another way that you can monetize that data that you've already collected. And so that's one of the reasons that we think that this is a really good strategy for publishers, because not only do you get to sort of monetize that inventory piece and that's gone away, but this actually gives you a second uh, benefit or a second opportunity to monetize that. And so before we get sort of into the details and maybe the formats, of data licensing, I think where I wanted to start was just to sort of give the context of why this is a growing um, sort of industry ecosystem within advertising. You know, all publishers, I think, are used to having their inventory. They're used to packaging it up and selling it and making it the most valuable. And most of your customers are going to be those media planners who are buying that inventory for that campaign. What's happening, though, in advertising, and we all see it, is that advertising is becoming more and more data related, right? Not only are the audiences and the data that you put onto the inventory itself, but you're starting to see brands come up with huge data strategies, right? The Oracle Marketing Cloud, Axiom, Xperia, Newstar, DMPs, brands are all starting to get data strategies. And what's also following is agencies are also starting to have their own internal strategy. So at every major holding company, there is a division who is creating a own, you know, holding company level data asset that that agency can then use in their own proprietary ways in order to service their customers better, right? So agencies can differentiate on the data that they own 
and, and service their clients, and that's how agencies are differentiating between each other. And so what that's actually provided the publisher ecosystem is the ability to contribute data into these ecosystems. So on the brand side, a brand will have you know, their own DMP, a brand will know everything that they know about their clients, and then if you think about that, they know about what their clients do in their own stores, they knew what clients do on their own websites. They may be able to connect that to some third-party data, but where data licensing for location comes into place is that it sort of fills this blind spot. You are now able to help a brand understand what happens outside of those places. So a brand, for example, may have a website. They may have a cookie with all this information on that website, but that brand doesn't know what that person does outside of that website. This location data that you guys are collecting on these users as they go about in their, day, in their uh, real world life is a way of augmenting that. And so there is a market by which you can augment your data sell directly to brands in these ecosystems. On the flip side, you're getting agencies. It's the same sort of story. Agencies are creating DMPs. Agencies are looking for data that they have uh, the rights to. And then once they have the right to, then they create proprietary products. And so that's really what data licensing is, is the ability to take information that you guys are collecting, and, and here we are talking primarily about location data, so understanding that users you know, shop at Walmart, or that users are sports enthusiasts because they go to football games, or users you know, are pet owners because they go to PetSmart. All of those things that we can infer about users' behaviors that can also be packaged up and sold as data licensing, and, and your clients are primarily audience companies. They are brands, and they are agencies. And just so you know, there's precedence for this, right? If you think about like the Exolates of the world or the Quantcasts of the world, these guys are collecting data based on you know, browsing behavior, right? A lot of publishers are taking information that they're getting on browse behavior, putting that into an Exolate model, and then Exolate will go create an audience for that, and publishers will get reimbursed based on the usage. So the precedence already exists, and so just the sort of thing that's new is that there's a growing demand for this location data. So that's sort of the context of what data licensing is. Now I'll get a little bit into sort of how to think about it, right? So you know, I think the first thing, as you know, Alan had talked about earlier as well, is privacy. Is this even legal? And so, you know, just to sort of give some broad strokes and give you guys guidance on how to think about this, I think there are two main things that I would think about um, as you explore a data licensing, uh, you know, business for yourself. Number one is your privacy policy. There is no, due to the way that location services work in mobile apps where it, the default is off and users actually have to go in and turn on location services so that the app can actually collect. And also, given the fact that you know everybody is bartering in the uh, IDFA and the Android ID, right? These uh, industry-approved advertising IDs, privacy-friendly because they can be deleted. Um, really, where privacy comes into place is going to be around disclosure in your privacy policy. You need to make sure that you are telling your users that the location data, you know, number one, that you guys are collecting precise location data, and number two this data may be licensed or shared with partners, right? So get the right language from your own in-house uh, counsel, but you know, that's the main thing is to make sure you have that disclosure. I think the second thing that you need to talk about or that you need to be aware of is a NAI, um, you know, OBA uh, tenant of not allowing users to combine online with offline data. So this data that you are collecting through mobile apps on location, that's considered online data. You're collecting it through the internet, even though people are out and about. And so you just got to make sure that you are talking to your buyers and understanding whether or not they are merging that with address data or anything other type of data that's collected offline. So I know that's you know a pretty broad stroke. I'm not trying to give all the details and go into the privacy policy here, but that's just make sure that's something that you guys are aware of and think about as you go into data licensing strategies. In terms of revenue models, 
I think the next thing that you guys need to think about is, you know, how do you monetize that? And so the way that I've seen most of this being done today is essentially through a CPM model. And so unfortunately CPM can mean a couple different things here. So one way that CPM is going to play itself out is a cost per thousand users, right? So if you are an app, you have three million users you may assign a value to a user, $5 is somewhere a reasonable number right now that I'm seeing in the marketplace, so $5 per user, and for that $5, you know, your, your purchasing, your licensing entity will have access to all the location data that you may have. And so, you know, what you're able to fetch in terms, you know, a range of $250 to, you know, 5 or $6 is going to be based on how much location data you actually have on those users. So that's one way of monetizing or thinking about the revenue model is per user. Another way is per record, so, you know, if you have a lot of users, um, but, you know, you may not be seeing so much information about each, each user and you really want, want to monetize on the number of records that you have, um, you know, having a thousand rows, a thousand location points, if you will, is another way of monetizing. And then lastly, you know, people are also starting to get into flat fee models, like, you know, that accounts for your growth, you may grow your users. But your advertiser, at the end of the day, you know, they have budgets as well. And so if you're trying to get into like a yearly commit, they don't really want to have uncertainty. They kind of have, need to know how much that is. So being open to a, uh, you know, flat fee per month is something that I think would be beneficial for you guys to think about as well, just because it sort of makes it easy to buy, right? Easy to buy, easy to sell, sort of going along that mantra. So those are some of the ways to think about the revenue model. In terms of integration, I guess my general point here is it's pretty easy. Um, there's sort of, you know, people who will do the work for you. So there's SDK integrations where, you know, there's companies like um, Venpath, Pipio, um, there's other companies out there as well that, you know, essentially are in this industry. So they will have an SDK. You implement the SDK, that company will then collect the data via the SDK and, and, and license the data on your behalf and give you a rev share. And that's sort of like the easy way, if you will. And then sort of on the other end of the spectrum is a bulk transfer, right, where you guys are actually taking the data, you're packaging it up, you're agreeing on a format and sending it out. So, you know, there's a pretty wide range of options for you guys. And most of it's been pretty easy from what I've seen. So that's data licensing, just in a nutshell, you know, second way of licensing your data. Um, and, and there's, you know, the messages, there's definitely a growing ecosystem for this type of data. All right, so the next section that I wanted to talk about, oops, I didn't mean to go two slides, is, is just to get you guys aware of a new form of measurement that many publishers are being accountable for. So you know, I'm sure there's probably some folks on the phone who have been approached by their agency, you know, whoever is buying their data and saying, hey, you know, I would love to buy, you know, run a campaign with you, but just so you know, you are going to be measured uh, by an independent party that is going to measure your ability to drive foot traffic. And so, you know, I, this, this section is really meant to give publishers a little bit of a 101 around that type of metric, right? So the new idea is that instead of being measured on view through rate or video completes, uh, especially advertisers that have retail stores are now utilizing a, a foot traffic attribution KPI so that, you know, they see who uh, got exposed to the ad and see if they went to a store. So just, you know, broad strokes the way this works, you guys, in general will serve an ad, you will either, you know, create a log file of all the people exposed or you'll run a pixel at ad time. That user is essentially giving over to the measurement company. The measurement company will use this location data that Alan has talked about and then they will, you know, judge and they will provide a metric on how well that campaign drove people into a store. So, you know, that's what offline attribution is, a new KPI headline. I think they're just, you know, to kind of give you guys a little bit of a background, there's two main sections out there, two main approaches in the market. One is a panel-based approach where you have a company that will know everywhere that a user goes, and so that's one solution on the market. And then you have other companies that are more 
taking advertising data, right? So sort of you'll go into a store, you may not use your app, you may miss it, but you, you bet there's a broader ecosystem of folks because you're not uh, tied to a panel. So yeah, I'm not going to get so much into the weeds around the two different approaches here. It's more just a, a high level to let you guys know that not, you know, th there are different methodologies by which uh, companies are judging or creating these foot traffic attribution reports. And so, you know, getting you guys exposed to the two different types is really what I meant to do here. And then lastly, go on the next slide here. Um, just another little nuance in terms of some of the foot traffic attribution reports that are out there. You're going to see that you're essentially going to get measured on two different things. You know, you serve an ad, did somebody go into a, sco into a store, that's going to be one metric that you're judged on, and then you are more and more companies are starting to do this as well. In addition to that metric, you're going to be measured on whether or not you drove incremental foot traffic, right? So if you sort of think about um, fast food, you maybe, you know, think of Taco Bell. Somebody goes into Taco Bell once a month, and then now Taco Bell runs a new promotion for a new crispy Doritos taco, or, you know, they did a free taco during the NBA Finals if a visiting team, you know, won a game. And then so now somebody went into a Taco Bell twice a month after seeing that ad exposure, right? So measuring that incrementality um, is a is also starting to become more and more in the foot traffic attribution. So that was really the you know that was the sort of exposure to this new uh, form of measurement for that how location data is being used. Eva, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. We um, before we turn it back over to Alan to talk about audience insights, we actually have one question regarding data licensing. Um, so the question is, is selling location-enabled ad inventory, so for example, via exchange, um, and licensing location data mutually exclusive on an impression-by-impression impression basis? So basically, can publisher sell, say, like a 300 by 50 ad slot that's location-enabled in exchange, um, and also licensing the location on that same user or impression? Absolutely. The, the answer to that is yes, you can definitely do that. And I think another thing I didn't know if I mentioned that I wanted to is ad blocking. So, you know, if you think about some of the fear around ad blocking, um, this is another way of monetizing in, in places where you don't have the inventory. Um, but to answer the question, yes, you can monetize that one ad call both ways. Got it. Thanks, Kevin. All right. Alan? Yeah, and I would just say as a publisher, um, double dip whenever you can. If you can sell it both ways, go for it. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what you can get from, basically as a publisher, how you can use the location data for your, for your sort of your audience intelligence and product intelligence. Um, essentially, the location data especially your first party data, but even third party data that, that you pull in can be used um, basically as, an, as a way to extend your analytics practice internally. Um, there's a lot of information. It can be tricky to use. So um, before you try to wrestle with that, I would, I would suggest one, you either have in-house talent that knows what they're doing and, and can handle the the sort of the lift in addition to whatever else they're doing, or um, reach out to some outside partners to help you uh, work on this. But um, you know, you can commingle this data with data that you already have, whether it's registration or product analytics or surveys. Um, it should complete, or maybe not necessarily complete, but sort of fill in more of the picture of who your users are, how they're using your products, and um, it ultimately should make you better. It should be part of sort of any product um, work that is done internally. And so, you know, when one of the things that, that um, you can do with the registration data is, is sort of validate, maybe not validate every person, but if you want to validate sort of the, generally speaking even, how truthful your registrants are. Um, I know that I am particularly bad about filling in registration information, um, zip codes, 
you know, I I almost always put in 10101. Um, I don't live in New York City, um, but if I am, you know, viewing a a uh, a publisher's page, and they see I'm in, you know, 30307, there and I do that with frequency they'll have a sense that uh, I may not live in New York City, I really live in Atlanta. Um, and that's a that's just a good, good way of just even gut checking your data. Not to necessarily look at specific individuals, although you could. Um, it also just gives you a sense of what's what's the, the frequency of, of um, I guess, reliability in your data for your registration, especially on a large pool. You can get you can get to some degree of feeling around that and just how much you want to use it, even for internal things, not even for selling, just understanding what's, you know, you're asking this zip code question, no one's answering, you know, 3% of people are answering correctly. Maybe you should just drop that question and simplify your registration page. Maybe you'll get a higher conversion on registration um, by dropping a barrier for some folks um, that they even have to waste time if they're not going to answer it truthfully. Um, I would say definitely product and design. Uh, I mean, product design and um, um, user experience can be um, heavily influenced by location data. I mean, how is the product being used? Where is it being used? Is it being used um, as you intended it? Does it match your expectations as a product manager or a product creator? Um, these kinds of questions when you dig into them, they should help drive either um, additional features or, or feature subtraction. I, you know, I just mentioned the zip code item. That may be a line item that you just eliminate because the, the data that you're getting just isn't good. Um, but regardless, it should incrementally improve your product if you're using it just as, a, as one of many reference points as, as you are going through your product build. And then as a publisher, I would say perhaps the m most important thing or one of the most important things, um, so Cox Media Group is we have 100 plus local radio, television, newspaper properties. I mean, one of the things that we're interested in is, you know, where's our audience? Where are they consuming us from? Um, and that can drive types of coverage. And so, um, you know, if you have a newspaper, then obviously you know you know where your subscriptions are, but that doesn't, I mean, what hits a driveway, for example, has really no bearing on what the mobile use looks like. And so maybe your, the geography of your mobile usage is very different. So, and, and you know where people are during the day. Um, that, can, that can influence stories that might need to happen. Maybe, you're, maybe you need to focus on where your restaurant reviews are. If there's a, a large portion of your work audience that's in a, a part of town that, you know, maybe it's all quick serve restaurants or maybe you want to cover, you want to do something around the best lunch dining guide, something like that. Um, and I'm totally stretching there, but it can drive content decisions from a newsroom perspective. Um, not, not in any bad way, but only in a good way because you know that it's, it should be contextually correct to your um, your audience and where they are at that time. And with that, I think yeah. I'm turning it back over to Eva. Yes. Thank you, Alan. Um, and thanks, all of you, for the great presentation. And now uh, we have some questions queued up for our presenters. Um, one question is regarding to the offline attribution um, tactics. So, are offline attribution technologies available in DSPs such as DoubleClick Bid Manager for publishers with a limited local inventory who buy extended audience online? Yeah, so I will take that. This is Kevin. So the here's so in the same in a lot of DSPs, you can go in and have a, when you're creating your media buy, you can do a checkbox and that will make that inventory, you know, be, uh, you know, viewability, you can put in IAS uh, fraud tag and those are available in the DSP as they click. As of this moment, there is no DSP and there's no offline attribution measurement company 
that has it available with a click of a button. I will say, though, that most of the major DSPs um, will allow um, offline attribution to happen, and that DSP will facilitate a measurement tag, so you can work with that DSP to get a tag. However, there's no checkbox, you know, like you can't go into turn and say, oh, I want to automatically run a foot traffic attribution report and it's going to cost me five cents CPM. That is probably going to come in 2017, 2018 from what I'm seeing. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Um, and then we have another question for Alan. So, Alan, as a publisher, what are some of the considerations that you think a publisher should keep in mind when evaluating third-party data partners? It's uh, a good question. I, you know, I think the quality of the data um, is is probably the top item. Um, you know, how how good is the data? A lot of people promise things, um, but can they deliver on it? I think the other thing that I would I would extend to that is so the quality of the data is really important and whether it's you know in getting into the accuracy, freshness, and precision that they have. Um, and how how can you work with them? I mean, are their APIs good? Is it is it easy to append the data to your to your world? And who do they have in house who's helping you think through it? Um, you might have some ideas, but uh, the truth is it's not your core and it's not your world and so how can they help you think through it and they should have some good ideas so a good partner um, will will bring ideas to the table to help you along. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I think in our document we have some questions um, compiled from the working group to help publishers think about um, some of the questions they should ask for data vendors, right? So I think, um, yeah, so I can definitely take a look at the document again um, after our webinar. And then we have another question that's for all the presenters. So um, if I want to offer location-enabled dynamic creative, how, uh, where do I get started? Wow. Um, <laughs> so, I, well, I, I'll say Kudos to you for thinking through that. Um, I guess um, I'm thinking of it from a local perspective, but it also probably works well at a national level, probably better at a national level. I was trying to think through what the creative looks like that's so differentiated that you would do it um, by location. But um, um, I might defer to either Vic Vikas or Kevin on that. but. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll defer to them and, and maybe come back to it in a minute. Yeah, this is Kevin. Um, so where I would start on that is you do have rich media vendors that specialize in this. So if you think about like Seltra or Flight or Fluent, I think these are rich media guys that will take location and then they will contextualize it and do dynamic creative for you. And so some of the ways that I've seen are related to weather, right? So the US Weather Service, there's an API that you can hit a lot long to, and then it'll give you the, the minimum temperature, the maximum temperature, the humidity, the forecast. And so, you know, those rich, I've seen a lot of those rich media companies embed that in their services. Okay, got it. Do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think uh, Kevin was right on. You need to find the right rich media vendor, and a lot of them offer the, um, the dynamic creative abilities, either with uh, their own integrations with the location services, like the, the weather API that Kevin mentioned, and then others also offer the ability for you to give um, a more packaged or sort of a more contextualized um, uh, packet of information that they can then dynamically trigger on. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we're almost running out of time, and then there are a few questions that are somewhat technical. So what we're going to do is to get back to you offline through email. Um, and then we just wanted to let you know on our IIB Mobile Center side, 
We have one more webinar left for this year. It's about how app publishers can move beyond merely driving app downloads and actually engage app users to maximize the lifetime value of the user. So sign up soon to secure your seat. And then with that, I just wanted to thank our speakers today for sharing their valuable insights, and thank you all for listening. And we'll see you soon at our future events.